Hi, Debbie and Catherine. Hello. Hi. My understanding of the idea of the Standard Gallery was that you were going to have guest curators bringing in new groups of artists every eight weeks, but it seems you're beginning to build a stable of represented artists. Is your vision of the gallery changing? Nope, it's exactly as it was from the beginning. When we started this gallery, we started on the basis of no rules. We started with a series of needs. What do we need? What do we need right now? And we build a structure around what we need. We didn't fit ourselves into that structure. So there's no reason for something that's been working so successfully to change it. And what's happening is we needed to represent these artists that were not represented in Philly. These are remarkable artists. They're internationally recognized and shown. And to not be represented in Philly was wrong. And we're remedying that. Well, these look hey. great. Hey, how you doing, Mom? How are you? It's a pleasure. Well, I know your work for years. I was with her. That's an awfully big painting. <laughs> it's small compared to the ones I'm doing now. Debbie, do you think you'll ever have one-person shows? Just like Catherine said, it'll depend upon the need. I don't anticipate that happening soon, but it's possible that it could happen in the future, and it's possible that something else could happen. Whatever we find the city needs, the, the art community needs, that's what we're going to do. Our guideline, our goalpost, is always to have wonderful art. Whether it's realistic, or whether it's abstract, or whether it's anywhere conceptual in between, it's always the level of the art that we're focusing on. There is something unique about how we select our artists and how we work with them. As artists ourselves, we're familiar with the black hole that your applications, your inquiries, and your phone calls go into when you try to reach out to a gallery. I understand now why they do that, in most cases. They're just inundated and they can't keep up, I get that. But at the same time, there's a certain amount of respect that every artist deserves. It takes a lot to put yourself out there and then to reach out and not get any response is disrespectful. So if somebody inquires, we will respond. Even if the response is it's not good to fit right now or maybe there's something is in the works that might be for consideration in the future or maybe it's a resounding yes, but they get a response. Barbara Fisher was born in New York City, educated in Colorado and California, and lived for many years on the West Coast before settling in Asheville, North Carolina in 1998. I asked Stanek Gallery co-director Deborah Fine about how this artist and her magical work became a part of this show. My husband and I went down to Asheville, and Asheville seemed like a good place because there's so many artists down there. So I was going through all of these art studios, and I walked into hers and fell in love with her work. It was exactly that. It's magical. And it's something that I've never seen elsewhere. So I asked her for her information and showed it to Catherine, and I showed it to Vanessa, and everybody had the same response. We all wanted to see her represented at this gallery. So we asked her, and she said she would love to. That's the whole story of it. The fairy tale ending to any artist. You're in a nice southern town and all of a sudden you're showing in a gallery in Philadelphia. Absolutely. <laughs>
With these, it took it even further, introducing perspective. The objects themselves are patterned. Someone got me this set of William Morris gift boxes. It allowed for this really fun opportunity to have the flat patterns, patterns in perspective, and then patterns on three-dimensional objects that are in perspective. You are astonishing. <laughs> Thank you. They were a lot of fun. Unfortunately, Stuart Schultz was out of town when I was filming the show, but I look forward to talking to him about his work. Many artists, once they find some success, continue to make the same kind of work as long as it is popular and selling. Stuart is not that kind of play-it-safe artist. I deeply admire his willingness to change and evolve his artistic practice based only on his internal aesthetic requirements. Stuart Schills was a classmate of mine at the Academy, and he's really been one of the most inventive and successful artists from our era. What are the images in this show? Are they paintings? I interpret them as more of a monotype because it takes on similar processes. It's not the same process. He's inventing something new, and that's what's beautiful about how he works, the way his mind works. He's just creating. He's creating with whatever tools he has at his disposal. So he's working with photographs. He's painting on photograph. He's taking that. He's photographing it, painting on that, until you get these layers that have these really juicy, rich color and dimension to them that takes contemporary photography and traditional painting and monotypes and merges them together in this beautiful composition. Stuart wrote me, what to say about my paintings? They are mostly ways of considering and responding to memory, other people's work, and my thoughts about the place of other people's work in my own imagination. For years now, painters like Giotto, Lorenzetti, and Duccio have been on my mind, and I reflect on them in various and varying ways. The recent election, of course, was very upsetting, hence the painting of the bloated blonde head. I recorded a cell phone conversation with another artist who couldn't be at the preview. My name is Carson Fox. I'm an artist from Brooklyn, New York. The work that I have is a collection of sculptures and a wall installation that I made specifically for the show. Usually I work with objects based on the natural world. So the installation is cast resin flowers. There were about a thousand of them that I put up on the wall. One of the things I like about these installations is that I can respond directly to the architectural demands of the space. And so it was really fun to put that one up in the gallery. The other works are based on rock and mineral formations. And they are fantasy takes on what happens naturally as minerals build over hundreds and thousands of years. That body of work really comes from my interest in science and, as a kid, having a rock collection and fantasizing about all kinds of things that might lay under the earth. As an adult, basically, I'm just remaking all of my fantasies, outlandish colors and ridiculous formations, which actually aren't that ridiculous because in nature, it's pretty amazing what nature comes up with. I, I really can't do anything that nature hasn't already beat me at. Speaking of color, one of them is all black. Occasionally, I like to work with black, although I primarily work with a lot of really bright and luminescent colors. That one just seemed to need to be black. I just wanted to make something that looked like it was this strange meteorite that fell to Earth. Do you repeat the same shapes over and over again? Everything comes from a mold in some form or another, but usually... I take the objects themselves and then recombine them with lots of other pieces that have been cast. I make the center part, which has the pin on it that gets stuck into the wall, as one form. And then the petal part will be cast from any number of different pieces. Usually I'll work with maybe 100 different centers and maybe 100 different background plates, let's say, for the petals. In that way, I can have lots and lots of different combinations. 
you can brush the mold with pigments and all kinds of really beautiful diamond dust and all sorts of really wonderful things. And so it's almost like making a monoprint each time. When I pour the resin, it captures whatever's on the surface of the mold. I might make a hundred that are from the same mold, but they all look a little bit different. So there really aren't any that you could point to and say, oh, that's identical to that one because they've all been treated differently. One of the most together artists I have ever met is Francis DeFranzo. He lives in California, but sent me this audio file about his paintings. The paintings I'm showing in Unveiled reflect the theme of the show itself. The paintings are about revealing something, but they're also very much about what remains hidden from view. In my painting Easement, there's a bright light illuminating a door, but there's a second light source on the other side of the building but we can't see what it's illuminating. And the entire scene I've created, the brick building, the stones, the dirt on the ground, and the telephone pole, they're all surrounded by this sort of penetrating darkness. All together, I'm creating a strong sense of mystery. What is on the other side of the building? What's behind that door? Creating a sense of mystery is very important to me. I see myself as being a storyteller as much as I am an artist. I want to create images in which a curious mind can roam and live within. The painting of the Desert Queen Motel is also very much about mystery. But in this instance, the mystery has more to do with time and place. The Desert Queen is not a real motel, but we all know it. It's the kind of place that you'd never want to spend the night. Even in a crunch, you'd rather sleep in your car. But there's a melancholy to the place as well. There's a story, perhaps many stories, being told here about the place itself, the people who stayed here, the things that have happened here. And the whole thing glows out of this darkness with this flickering blue-green fluorescent light. It's as if we're in a different world. I want to take you somewhere new. I want to take you to a different world. And I want to unveil it to you. very excited to get them out and about. The one I'm perhaps most excited about is this portrait of Johnny Eck, who is known as the King of the Freaks, nature's greatest mistake, the only living half boy, who's a bit of a renaissance man or half renaissance man from Baltimore. He was an acrobat and magician and a painter and a puppeteer and drove race cars and he lacked a lower body. So he had a twin brother who had all of his limbs and they performed a magic act together, sawing a man in half act. Robert would lay down, they would do the act and then Johnny would get up and people would faint and fall about because they thought they had actually cut his legs off. It was quite a thing. I asked Deborah Fine what she was doing new in her work. Well, I have several pieces that are new, but the piece that is most exciting to me is this large piece that I did as a companion piece to a commission. I'd never done pastels quite this large, and once I had done it, I fell in love with the freedom that this size gives me. Debbie, where do you get paper that big? To get anything this large, you have to buy the paper by the roll, which means it's going to be curled, and it has a very distinct memory. So you have to take the paper, you cut it, you wet it, soak it, and then put stuff on top of it that is heavy and weighs it down for at least a week. And then you can take it out and then you can use it. And then I have all of the other pastels that I've been doing that are pretty much in the same size range as previously. Catherine, I thought you worked in concrete, and yet you seem to be carving in wood. That's not wood, it is concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I had a commission last year in South Jersey, where the native Lenape tribe was from. The Lenape speak of the history and the, the origins of man evolving from a tree. In his isolation, man bends, the tree splits, and woman is born, and that's the beginning of creation. 
And that was a particularly moving story and belief system that inspired that sculpture. So I traveled to Tennessee to work with a few artisans who work with concrete and do this faubois technique to make concrete look like wood in direct modeling. They're remarkable artists. Give them a plug. The workshop was held at Sherry Warner Hunter's studio where she invited Donald Tucker to teach the faubois techniques that he's been handed down. I came back and I did this commission and I enjoyed it so much and I had so much more to say, I continue to work on it in a small scale for myself. Would you like a card? Yes. Here you go. What? The Stanek Gallery restaurant? What is going on? No, it's not Stanek Gallery restaurant. We're partnering with Will. They are going to prepare a five-course meal with wine pairings, set up the whole place like a restaurant in the current exhibition on the walls, so you'll have a dining and visual experience yeah. like no other. That's going to be June 15th. And who gets to come to this? Anybody who buys a ticket. Every penny of your ticket price applies to the purchase of a work of art. How about a quick preview of new shows? We're having a summer invitational, and this is artists that have been following the gallery or that we've been following, but immediately following that, we're working with Natalie Italiano and Leona Shanks on an exhibition in honor of Nelson Shanks on the second anniversary of his passing. We are bringing in artists from all over who've worked with, for, in conjunction with, influenced by Nelson Shanks. Oh, that should be pretty exciting. It is yes. very exciting. Mm -hmm. We've been looking at these images for a while, and <laughs> there's some really remarkable artists. Yes. All right.